Hey guys, it's Dr. Jolene Brighton, and in this video, we're going to talk about the phases of your menstrual cycle. So as you're coming on, let me know where you're at in the world, where you're joining me from, and let's chat about the different phases of your menstrual cycle. And of course, there's going to be Q&A, so I will answer your questions. Now, in medicine, we recognize three phases of your menstrual cycle. That is the follicular phase, the ovulatory phase, and the luteal phase. Now, you'll also hear some people say there's four phases in your menstrual cycle. There's nothing wrong with saying that, but I want to help you understand that in medicine, we have three phases, why that is, and why your doctor might be confused if you start talking about four phases of your menstrual cycle. Now, to help you understand all of this, I want to start by taking you through a natural menstrual cycle. That is that you are not on hormonal birth control. And I talk all about this in my book, Beyond the Pill. There's an entire chapter dedicated to helping you understand your menstrual cycle, your period, and your period problems, what they mean and what you can do about it to help optimize and balance your hormones. Okay, so Day one of your menstrual cycle, that's when we start counting the menstrual cycle, it's the first day that you see blood. So you have a flow, your period, that's day one of your menstrual cycle, and that kicks off the follicular phase. Now the follicular phase is going to last approximately days one through 14 of the cycle or until ovulation occurs. For you, you might ovulate sooner. So you might ovulate around day 10, and there's nothing wrong with that. So Talking about the three phases of the menstrual cycle in medicine, day one is the first day that you see blood. That occurs because your endometrial lining, the lining of your uterus, is beginning to shed, and that's because your hormones have dropped. So your body got the signal that there was no baby, so it dropped estrogen and progesterone, triggering you to shed the endometrial tissue. Now, why medicine classifies the follicular phase as one phase, and sometimes you'll hear health coaches and nutritionists talk about four phases of the menstrual cycle, is because they're saying, okay, the period is something different in itself, and you may feel a little bit different during your period. But in medicine, and physicians specifically do not recognize that the menstrual phase is separate in the follicular cycle. And the reason for that is because during the follicular part of your cycle, you are getting an egg ready for ovulation. That's the main event that's going to happen. And so while you may still be bleeding, your follicle stimulating hormone, what the brain says to the ovaries, this is FSH that we measure in our blood, is recognizing. So your brain's like, whoa, we ain't got any hormones around because we just started our period and we need to get ready for baby making round two or 10 or, you know, 100th, wherever you're at in your menstrual cycle history. And so we've found FSH tells the ovaries, let's get a follicle ready and let's start making estrogen. So while you're still bleeding and you're having a period, your follicle stimulating hormone is rising as is your estrogen. Okay. And that's, that's when we start plumping things up. So I'm in my follicular phase right now. My lips are a little more plump. Like this is an ideal day to be on camera because, um, fine lines and wrinkles, there's less of those showing up because of estrogen levels rising. So during the follicular phase, estrogen is your main diva. So she is rising and she's doing her job to get the endometrium ready, to get you looking all sexy so that when it comes ovulation time, you're in the mood for baby making. Now, estrogen is rising in the follicular phase. And then you'll also find that testosterone begins to rise in the latter half of the follicular phase. And that's getting you in the mood. So when your libido spikes, that's usually a good indication that ovulation is coming. To understand as a cyclical creature, you don't have a libido like all day, every day, nonstop, can't stop, want to knock it around in the bedroom. That's not going on. It's totally normal for women to be in the mood for one part of the cycle and a little less in the mood for another part. And whatever is true for you, it's totally fine. No, judges. Your libido is your libido, but you should have a libido. Okay. So we're going to have testosterone rise. That's sometimes when we see acne starting to crop up. And with that, testosterone is going to rise. And then what's going to follow is a surge in luteinizing hormone and estrogen that will trigger your body to release an egg. Now you're in the ovulatory phase. So remember, I started this um, video off by saying, Follicular, ovulatory, luteal phase. Those are our three phases. So follicular phase, getting the egg ready. We spike LH and estradiol. 
That's when your basal body temperature will spike as well. You release an egg. Now you've got a 24 hour period of the ovulatory phase. Um, for you, those of you jumping on saying you just ordered Beyond the Pill and you're excited, I'm super excited as well. And you're gonna find all of these details on how to understand your body, work with your body naturally, optimize your hormones, understand what those period problems mean and get root cause solutions to that beyond birth control. And if you do choose to use birth control for contraceptive reasons or because you want to manage your symptoms, I'm going to support you in the book as well. Okay, so we're in the ovulatory phase. Um, that is when we're like, we're just like, when we go to ovulate, we're like super sexy time. Um, there's actually been studies showing that uh, strippers get paid more. They earn more money um, when when they're um, about to ovulate because the male counterparts in our society find us a lot more attractive. That has to do with our pheromones, but also the way the hormones make us look and make us feel. So after ovulation, what follows is the luteal phase. Now, whether or not you want to have a baby, if you are in your fertile years, then you want to ovulate because when you ovulate, a structure in your ovaries is left behind known as the corpus luteum. That is going to secrete your progesterone. Now, progesterone becomes the diva of the luteal phase and progesterone is getting your uterine lining ready so that you can get into baby making. It's also going to help you sleep, feel really chilled out. If you've ever had like days leading up to your period where you're like, I am so happy and I love my family and I'm so grateful for everything, your progesterone is right. <laughs> and if you've had days leading up to your period where, you know, like some of you have been quoting out of Beyond the Pill, I asked my patients like coming, you know, one to two weeks before your period, do you A, want to run away to the woods and never be seen again? B maybe you want to kill people in your life or C, like do all of the above. That means your progesterone is not right. Um, do I teach syncing your cycles with the moon? This is a question coming in. And if so new moon, full moon with menstruation, ovulation. So yes, Emma, I do teach um, syncing your cycle to your moon, to syncing your cycle up with the moon. You'll read about that and be on the pill. There's a lot about your understanding your cycles, the moon cycle, and how to support that sinking. And I talk about white moon goddess and red moon goddess and how we're different, right? Some of us ovulate with the full moon and some of us ovulate with the new moon. And it's all about what's true for you. And that's totally cool. So I'm in the follicular phase right now. I start my period with the full moon and I ovulate with the new moon. These tend to be the women who are out there, mover shakers, medicine makers, um, whereas the opposite of that, that's what they think is like the breeder cycle. Like, oh, you're here to have babies because full moon, as I say, and be on the pill comes out. Evolutionarily speaking, we're living in caves. It wakes you up. What you're going to do? There's predators outside. You can have sex, right? You can wake up and have sex. So um, that's why it's thought to sync up with the actual full moon that you're ovulating. However, know that these women have big work to do in the world as well. They are downloading a lot of information and they are, they're very intuitive creatures as well. Um, and you can flip cycles just depending on where things are at for you and what your mission is and what you're currently manifesting and working on. So I do teach that. And Emma, I have a cosmic cycle syncing program as well that I welcome you to check out. You can email info at drbrighton.com if you want to get more information on the programs that I offer. So lots of questions coming in as I am talking about the phases of the menstrual cycle. So I have my period days one through three, then around day five or six, I start spotting a little brown blood. Um, and I see you want me to talk about estrogen dominance in the follicular phase. So if we um, if we start spotting brown uh, blood, you're in chapter eight of Beyond the Pill and you love it. That is awesome. Um, I, I love that. Uh, so good. So good to uh, hear that. Okay. So anytime we start, start spotting brown blood, understand that that is likely oxidized. Well, it is. It's oxidized blood. So what that means is, is that you've been um, not so efficient at moving out that endometrium and having your period. Oxygen hits the iron in your blood. And now it becomes brown. You see that brown spotting. And so that's definitely something to examine more. And I um, talk all about that in Beyond the Pill. 
Um, Emma, I do talk about flipping your cycle and your moon cycles in the on the pill. There's an entire um, section in the book about that. I talk about moon cycles a lot, if you guys know me. So we've been covering in this video the three phases of the menstrual cycle, uh, follicular, ovulatory, and luteal phase. Um, and so there's a question coming in about anxiety and panic, and I'm going to address that in just a second. So with that, medicine recognizes the follicular phase as a soul, uh, solely the phase. It doesn't mean that like um, non-licensed practitioners who talk about the four phases of the menstrual cycle are doing anything wrong. Like they're just talking about honoring your period and having different self-care um, practices around your period. I think that's perfectly fine. But I had so many of you writing me saying, I went to my doctor and I talked about four phases of my menstrual cycle and they looked at me like I had two heads. This is because you know, we are not in medicine. We are trained to look at the follicular phase as one phase because what we're looking at is that the main goal of the body is to get an egg ready. Um, you're going to order the book, Emma. That's so fantastic. And for those of you who have ordered Beyond the Pill, I'd love to hear, like, what are your big ahas? I know the biggest um, things I've been seeing is so many women are like, wait a minute, I thought this was a book on birth control, but now you're talking about autoimmune disease and SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, and there's information about you know ad adrenal fatigue, which is known as HPA dysregulation, and about hypothyroidism and Hashimoto's and my libido and fertility and how to have a natural menstrual cycle and not have heavy periods, painful periods, mood swings. I'm like, yeah you know I got you. It is a woman's hormone book. Um, I am a, uh, you know, I practice natural medicine as it applies to the women's endocrine system. So I'm talking about all hormones in there. And I want you to feel supported to use birth control, to not use birth control, to reverse symptoms of post birth control syndrome, or to go a totally different way and work with your doctor and manage your symptoms naturally. Now, when it comes to anxiety and panic attacks, so this, the, one of the most common times we will see this is in the luteal phase for women. Now, you can have this at any time because of adrenal function. Now, your adrenal glands, was, um, those are going to fire off cortisol. We know that. They also fire off epinephrine and norepinephrine. And as you read in Beyond the Pill, I call these the freak out hormones because they hit your brain and then you want to freak out. You're like, whoa, what's happening? Um, there must be a lion or tiger or something going on um, that's freaking me out. Um, so with that, your body um, will go into panic. So it can be adrenal related and it could come out of nowhere. Um, with or it might be like you are in traffic or you have a meeting. Now, the other times that we see mood changes as it relates to hormones is anxiety um, related to thyroid hormone or depression. So hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism can both, um, really lend to anxiety and depression. So keep that in mind. And then the other thing that, uh, we see is what I was talking about with the luteal phase. Um, so cool. You guys are, uh, shouting out beyond the pill and how much it's helping you. This is awesome. So with that, in the luteal phase, this is when if you ovulated, progesterone rises. It stimulates the GABA receptor in your brain. GABA is the neurotransmitter that's like, yo, all is good. Let's be calm. Epi nor epi from the adrenals comes in and is like, let's freak out. And GABA's like, slow your roll. Just slow your roll. We're going to go take a nap. <laughs> it's all going to be good. Um, and it won't necessarily make you sleep, but it's just like, no, it's all good. So that's what progesterone can do. Progesterone is also a diuretic, so it can help with water retention. Um, when your progesterone is right, you sleep a lot better, your PMS is non-existent, like your periods should be easy if your progesterone is right. And so with that, understand that if you don't ovulate, you will not get your progesterone up. We can also have issues where we can't get progesterone up because maybe we're deficient in vitamin C. Maybe we're not hanging out with uh, friends enough. Maybe we're like banana stressed out and the brain is like, yo, shut down ovulation or stop making that progesterone because we need to make cortisol and survive this stressful event. And stressful things can be like, you know, banana stressed out crazy at work or somebody just died like the and things you can't control but it also can be that you're stressed out you're over exercising you're under eating you're not sleeping um, and you're continuously sending the signal signal to your body that the environment is not safe okay so those are some things that can affect progesterone and that's why like every doctor in the world is like everybody stop stressing because it impacts our body in so many ways and 
that can lend to mood symptoms. And as you'll read in Beyond the Pill, so in Beyond the Pill, there's an entire chapter called Take Back Your Mood, where I take you through, okay, how do your hormones influence your mood? We want to know that. How does birth control, hormonal birth control, influence your mood? That's important to know as well. What can happen when we come off of hormonal birth control? And how can that impact our mood? And understand that a lot of times when we're having hormonal-related mood symptoms, it's not just estrogen. It's not just progesterone. It's usually estrogen, progesterone, cortisol, thyroid, insulin. Like they're all working together. Oxytocin gets in there. So oxytocin can make you feel really good. Um, hug people and have orgasms if you want some more of that. Orgasms are the fountain of youth. And if you don't know, now you know. <laughs> and in Beyond the Pill, you get a lot of orgasm talk and we talk about those hormones. Now, one thing I haven't talked about with anxiety, depression, mood swings is estrogen. Now, estrogen, like all hormones, has this Goldilocks like kind of situation going on where it's like not too much, not too little, not too hot, not too cold, just the right amount, and we feel good. So we like to vilify hormones sometimes. And um, as I started this conversation, you know, estrogen is lovely. It's why we plump up our breast, our, our booty, our hips. It makes our mates attracted to us. Your lips get fuller. Your fine lines and wrinkles start to disappear. Um, it makes your brain fire really well. It protects your heart. It does a lot of things. Um, it can help with modulating the immune system. So the other thing, though, is that if you have estrogen dominance, which I have other videos that are on YouTube that you can check out about estrogen dominance, and with that, if you have estrogen dominance, you can have um, symptoms of irritability. That's where like it interplays with a low progesterone. Now we're anxious, but we're irritable, and we just like we're just like oh my god, if like my husband says one thing or looks at me wrong, like I'm a freak out. I've been there. Put your hands up if you've been there. Like we get to say it's our hormones. They don't get to say it's our hormones, but that's a sign. That's a sign that something's in balance. It's not a sign that you are broken, that you are crazy, or any of that negative stuff that gets passed around society. That's not what that's about. That's a sign and a symptom that's an opportunity to heal your hormones and heal your body. So um, any explanation for why I can only lose weight when I'm on my period. So our hormones do um, interplay with our weight. What's really interesting about only losing weight when you're on your period is that uh, a lot of women notice losing weight in their luteal phase when progesterone rises. But it may be, and, and that's partly because you lose water weight and what's going on with muscles and fat cells, but it also may be that like you might have mad cravings in your luteal phase, and that can be because progesterone starts um, burning fuel, but also, like your body is like, let's make a baby. Let's like store calories so that we can make a baby. And like, that's what your body's trying to do. And so maybe that, and then there's also an interplay with like dopamine and serotonin and brain hormones. And uh, so with that, that can also increase your cravings. So if you're noticing you gain weight during the luteal phase, I'd start exploring like what's going on with what you eat. In my period problem solution course, I take you through how to eat like throughout your um, menstrual cycle and like different um, self care practices and mantras and all kinds of stuff to like work with your body, um, which is really born out of my uh, medical clinicals, my medical clinical, my medical clinic, working one on one with um, patients, giving me feedback and uh, what I learned when I was in naturopathic medical school. So um, in terms of your period, just to recap, your period is the first day that you see blood and you want to track these symptoms. Day one, first day that we see blood, you want to evaluate your mood, your energy, your sleep, your period cramps, your uh, skin, your digestion, and start looking at your whole body. You want to track how many days is my period and how many days is it from day one until the next period that comes? Now, day one to roughly day 14 or ovulation is your follicular phase. Ovulation is when you release the egg, a 24-hour event known as the ovulatory phase. Then we roll into the luteal phase and... Um, 
If you did not ovulate, it may be shorter. And it may be that your period's coming like less than every 21 days. And that's a sign that you don't have enough progesterone. And if you missed the beginning of this, go back, rewind, watch it, um, where I talk about some of the reasons that we can have low progesterone or inability to make progesterone. If you understand those reasons, then you easily can identify what to do differently. And beyond the pill, my new book, I take you through exactly what to do to make your periods as easy as possible, to banish PMS for good, to have healthy menstrual cycles, to troubleshoot. There's a whole chapter in there of like, you have this period problem. What does that mean? What to do about it? What lab testing you need? Um, so Tanya, Tanya, sorry, you have a question here. You were orthorexic for eight years, a commonly recognized problem. That's why beyond the pill, you will find that I'm like, no, I say in there, no food food is bad. And again, like hormones, we like to vilify food as well. Food is not bad. Um, food is delicious. I'm a foodie. I love it. Um, so I just want to speak to that because there's a lot of good, true information out there, but all that matters at the end of the day is what's true for your body. So you were orthorexic for eight years. You lost your period mostly all of the time. I had one here and there. I have hypothyroidism, now recovering amenorrhea and fixing hormones. Can I get off the pills? Um, I think maybe you're talking about uh, thyroid medication, and that's something that, you know, sometimes women can get off of a thyroid medication. It just depends. If the root cause, like you're saying, yes, is a thyroid medication. So if the root cause of your thyroid condition is autoimmunity, uh, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is 97% of the cases in the United States, then it may be that there's been tissue destruction to the thyroid, little gland that sits on the uh, front of your neck there, that will require thyroid medication. And so it really just depends. Um, Tanya, I want to encourage you to go check out my videos on YouTube about Hashimoto's, about hypothyroidism, and give you lots of tips surrounding that. And the thing you have to understand, everybody listening, and there's tons of you, thank you for being here is that with hypothyroidism comes period problems. So if your thyroid isn't right, you're probably going to have irregular periods or you might lose your period altogether or you'll have really heavy long periods. This can be a common reason we get offered birth control as well. And hormonal birth control won't fix your period and it won't fix a uh, hypothyroidism. It doesn't address that. It can make hypothyroidism worse. Tanya, I'd also recommend checking out Beyond the Pill, my new book. There's an entire chapter about recovering your thyroid health. Um, and how to support that. And I would really go into that book, get those root cause tools and understand like how to talk to your doctor so that you can have that conversation of, can I come off of this thyroid medication? But really um, until like the gut, the liver, the uh, adrenal glands, um, and you know, depending on your age, also the ovaries are all healthy. It's not necessarily a good idea to transition off of um, thyroid medication. And why I say your ovaries is because there's an interplay between estrogen and thyroid and that, and then progesterone as well. And that's really, really important. Um, yeah. They, okay. So you had your kids before you started having, she, uh, Tanya saying that she started, had her kids before she started having digestive issues, hormonal issues after your C-section not uncommon. Um, and the meds are helping you get your T3 and T4 up and they're, they're helping you grow your hair. Your skin is looking glowing and not dry and your nails, um, thyroid, uh, medication can help with digestion, optimal, uh, gallbladder function, liver health. I mean, thyroid medication is doing so much. Um, if you need that replacement and the thing to understand is we can't live without thyroid hormone. We were born needing thyroid hormone. It's non-negotiable. It's not like Tylenol. You weren't born needing Tylenol. Um, so you might use it if you have a headache every now and again, but if you have to use it every single day, something's wrong there. Thyroid medication is not that kind of medication. It's a hormone replacement therapy of a hormone that you absolutely need to thrive and survive. And it impacts what we've been talking about this entire time, which is the phases of your menstrual cycle. And so if we don't have adequate thyroid hormone, that's where really we can stop ovulating. We can have miscarriages. We can have infertility. We can have long periods, heavy periods, irregular periods. We can have depression, anxiety, sometimes cyclical, sometimes all the time. Us ladies are really complicated like that. That's the fun part. That's why I love my job. That's why I love being a doctor. Um, how do hormones change when you're pregnant? So you're not having a cycle, which is all the things that we've been talking about. And so when you're pregnant, it's actually all about getting your hormones up, 
And then making sure that we maintain a healthy pregnancy so that baby has the best outcome, you have the best outcome. Then when you deliver your placenta, once that's delivered, your hormones drop to that similar to a postmenopausal woman or like when your hormones drop right before your period. And then what's happening is prolactin is rising. Your thyroid can get impacted. Please go check out my videos on YouTube. Go to drbrighton.com. Read my articles about postpartum thyroid disease because that's a real thing. Um, and so with that, uh, just definitely understand that it can take like a year or more to get your cycle back. And so that prolactin, it uh, it'll actually in the brain from the brain level is telling the body like let's we're we're good we're we're lactating we're making milk for a baby like let's not do any of this like ovulating thing, but some women get their period back right away. Um, why do periods stop for a day and then start again? One reason can be because of. Um, ineffective contractions of the uterus. Um, and it's not abnormal. Just so you know, a lot of women um, experience that. And so it can be something, you know, where uh, there's changes happening with the hormones, but it also can be something we're bringing in um, an herb like red raspberry leaf tea can be beneficial. So you could just drink it. And um, what we've come to understand is that it increases the circulation, blood perfusion to the uterus in a way that I uh, strengthens the uterus. So we, uh, you know, midwives use this in pregnancy. So do a lot of docs um, to help that uterus be as effective in contracting as possible to move baby out because that's what you want to do when it's time to have a baby. And with that, you know, the other thing is that you can use it as a menstruating female. I actually like right outside my window, grow my own red raspberry leaf and drink that tea. So then you strengthen the uterus and help with effective contractions. Um, I'm going to drink a little mushroom tea because I've been talking. If you guys haven't seen, like I was last week flying all over the place. I interviewed for the Model Health Show. Um, Ricky Lake hosted my book signing I um, in New York City for Beyond the Pill. I spoke for three hours there. Then I went and um, I recorded uh, two, hour, two and a half hours of Ricky Lake and Abby Epstein's new documentary about birth control. I was on Mind Body Green's podcast. So I'm like, I've been talking nonstop and I'm drinking my mushroom tea. So this is Lion's Mane, uh, Chaga, Reishi, Cordyceps. So adaptogens, also brain nourishing. This tea is super feast for those of you asking. Um, so you recently stopped taking the pill, but I work out a lot and drink whey protein. Should I stop drinking it? It depends. NTA just dropped down. NTA is like loves Dr. Brighton. Hands up. Thank you guys. So. I will be uh, doing a book signing uh, for the Nutritional Therapy Association on Friday, March 1st um, for Beyond the Pill. So if you're there, definitely check it out. Um, does my book talk about PCOS? Beyond the Pill talks a lot about PCOS, like a whole lot about PCOS. And you can read the Amazon reviews on that. And by the way, you guys, um, for those of you who are saying you're going and buying Beyond the Pill, go to beyondthepillbook.com and claim your gratitude bonuses. I'm going to a bunch of freebies, over $250 in gifts for you. So wherever you buy in the world, any version, go grab those, get those. You're going to get exclusive interviews, recipes, and all kinds of stuff. Now, um, with regards to PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome, since we've been talking about the phases of the um, menstrual cycle, I think these are great question, a uh, great question to weave into all of this. Polycystic ovarian sy syndrome, uh, one of the hallmarks of that condition is that you have anovulatory cycles. So that means you don't ovulate consistently. And with that, if you're not ovulating consistently, then you're going to have inconsistent periods. And so when we PCOS, as we, you know, we're always classically defining the menstrual cycle as like a 28 day cycle, understand we're all a little bit different. Women with PCOS tend to have a little bit longer cycles when we do get them regular. So in my clinical practice, my patients with PCOS, once we start um, having a regular menstrual cycle, it's usually like every 35 days. And there's no problem with that. Like consistency and you know, being regular is the most important thing. And in Beyond the Pill, I talk all about that. Yes, the book is great uh, for people who don't take the pill. It's called Beyond the Pill because I want you to understand that you can fix your hormones and fix your body beyond birth control. So I know you're going to get birth control offered to you. You're going to go to the doctor's office. You're going to be like, I got period problems. Your doctor's going to say, pill for every female ill. Here you go. Maybe an IUD, maybe a pap, maybe a NuvaRing, maybe a depo shot. 
I want to give you root cause solutions to your hormonal issues so that you can decide, do I really want to use birth control or do I want to address the root cause? I give you labs, I give you lifestyle, I give you supplements, I give you dietary practices, and I give you the education you need so you can have a more informed discussion with your doctor and get to the root cause of your symptoms. So the book is for women who have never been on birth control women who are currently on birth control so they can avoid the side effects, stay safe on it, and those who develop post-birth control syndrome when they transition off. Now, PCOS women, because they have irregular cycles, doctors pass them the pill at a really high rate. So PCOS and endometriosis, these are some of the gals that get past the pill at a really high rate, and it's a disservice for a few reasons. Now, I'm not shaming you. If you want to use it to treat your symptoms, like that's your choice, 100%, and I support you in the book. But understand this. One is it might mask your symptoms. So if you're having painful periods, if you're having, and I'm talking debilitatingly painful periods in general, or regular periods, or cystic acne, or losing hair on your head, growing it on your chin, chest, abdomen, and your doctor passes you birth control, what they might actually say is like, well, I fixed your period. Therefore, um, you're fine. We don't need to follow up on you. But as I talk about in the metabolic mayhem chapter of my book, PCOS is an inflammatory condition that's also rooted in blood sugar dysregulation. We understand that there is also a bacterial component going on in the gut. And so with that, if you pass a woman the pill for PCOS without discussing what's actually going on, one, you're masking the symptoms, which is fine. Like nobody wants hair on their chin or acne or any of that. No judges there. But the problem is, is that these women are at higher risk for stroke, heart attack, and diabetes. And as I talk about in the metabolic mayhem chapter of my book, PCOS women are at a higher risk of that anyway, so giving them the pill could be downright dangerous in their health, and it could push them closer to cardiovascular disease or diabetes, and you just should know that. Like you should just know that if you're going to take the pill, and your doctor should monitor you, and you should have lab testing, so if you are on it, you should know, am I safe or not? So the other issue with polycystic ovarian syndrome is that if you give a woman the pill, but you don't address the root cause of the blood sugar imbalance and the inflammation, she might come off that pill 20 years later and be like, well, I want to have a baby. And then you're like, well, you have PCOS and it's been unmanaged and there's a lot of work to do here. And now you're 35 and we've got to like hustle so we can get you baby body ready. So it's things like this that I'm like, I have no issue if you want to use the pill for symptoms or contraceptive reasons, but you divert, you deserve an informed consent. You deserve to know how your menstrual cycle works, how your fertility works, what the pill could be doing to your body, how to safely transition off of it and avoid post-birth control syndrome, and what should be monitored throughout your life cycle as long as you're on it so that you know that you're in a good place and that you know bad things aren't going to come your way because we shouldn't have to live in fear either way. Fear of acne, fear of infertility, fear of cancer, fear of stroke, like whether you're on or off of birth control, I want to support you and be on the pill because really this is about putting the medicine in your hands. So at the end of the day, you know, you made the best decision for your body. And part of that is teaching you all about your menstrual cycle so you can understand it. And that's what I do in Beyond the Pill. And that's what I've been doing in this video today is going through the phases of your menstrual cycle so you can understand it. And if you're tracking, how do I feel in my period? How do I feel leading up to ovulation? How do I feel when I ovulate? How do I feel after ovulation? What about the week before my period? Am I pooping? Is my skin breaking out? Do I have mood swings? Is my sleep disrupted? If you understand those symptoms, you can dial in what's going on. And beyond the pill, I give you an entire quiz to understand your hormone imbalance. And then they say, you take the quiz. And I'm like, go here, jump in. And it's diet first, lifestyle first. And then there's supplement protocols that you can choose to implement. But no, it's got to be like foundational work of diet and lifestyle. And it is not dogmatic by any means. I freaking hate dogma. I hate when people are like, no one in the world can ever eat dairy. Maybe. Maybe that's true for them, but maybe it's not true for you. And that's what I want to help you understand and be on the pill is what is true for you. So tracking menstrual cycles, uh, this is a great question. So, you know, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, um, they, uh, so ACOG, they termed the menstrual cycle the fifth vital sign that was several years ago. 
And what that means is, is that your period and your menstrual cycle has incredible data to evaluate your health. And in that, understand that you're going to have period problems usually before your labs start showing you problems. So you living in your body and recognizing what's going on, so, so crucial. Now, if you want to go old school and you want to track your symptoms on a calendar, totally fine to do. I pass my patients paper journals. Um, there's something about handwriting that actually helps you remember things um, better in, in all things, but also it can help you remember like what your experience is like in your menstrual cycle. You can also get apps. So um, there are lots of apps out there today. I am a medical advisor for Ask Tia. That's another app that you can check out. You might want to couple it with something like uh, you know, a femtech device like Daisy or um, Natural Cycles, and be doing your basal body temperature, and then tracking your symptoms with that as well. What's the best tracker out there? The one you'll use, the one you'll be consistent with. And so you just got to ask what's best for you. I have lots of patients who prefer paper calendars. I have other ones that use their Google Calendar. I have some patients that use their notes um, in their iPhone, for example. I have other ones who use fancy apps. Like, it's really up to you. And it's all about what can you be consistent with and what's going to work for you. And um, I think that's just a really important take home right there. It's like, what's going to work for you? Ask yourself that question. Um, so... Lots of questions coming through. I'm actually doing my first YouTube live right now, but I also have Instagram live coming as well. So my YouTubers are like, why do she keep looking up? Because I'm looking up at my um, at my uh, Instagram people as well. Um, so with so talking about pain, painful periods, um, Onyx twenty two. That's a lot of caps, so I'm not totally sure I'm like reading everything correctly here, but for endometriosis, laparoscopy is the gold standard for the diagnosis. And generally, when you have that surgical procedure, while it's um, mildly invasive compared to other surgeries, um, that is something that they usually take tissue as well. So they remove the adhesions. And so endometriosis, as we're talking the phases of the menstrual cycle, these are the women who have super painful periods. And I'm not talking like, you know, oh, I like got a pop of my doll and like you make that happen. And I'm talking like on the ground, writhing in pain, vomiting, can't even poop because it hurts so bad. Um, and that's usually like worse in the luteal phase. Hey, Dr. Navaz, I was just hanging out with him in uh, New York City. You were actually there when that woman in Times Square. So I was in Times Square in New York City. And this woman like comes out of nowhere and she's like, are you Dr. Jolene Brighton? And um, I was like, how do you even know me out of the thousands of people on Times Square? It's the big hair. It's the big hair. But she, her daughter was reading Beyond the Pill and she was talking about how much that this book was transforming her daughter's life and the life that like, everybody in the family. Um uh, so a uh, question about uh, coming off the pill, um, should you attack all the problems at once or is there a good starting place in beyond the pill? I guide you in that. So you'll know exactly where to go. If you take the quizzes that are in there, you're going to get really clear and refined in what to do. So beyond the pill is loaded with quizzes, loaded with information of like everything that you should have been told the day you got your period, everything you should be told about what period symptoms mean, about period problems. Um, and with that, you know, in Beyond the Pill, I'm also going to take you through like adrenal health, thyroid health, gut health, liver health, libido health, fertility health, like all of that business. So I want to say thank you for everyone who's been supporting Beyond the Pill. There's so many of you shouting it out right now. It makes my heart just swell. I really appreciate it. Um, if you consider going to Amazon or somewhere else and leaving like your, your thoughts about like, I read the book. This is what I think about it. So many women have benefited from hearing from you directly of like how the reader has experienced the book. I appreciate if you can leave me some comments. Let me know, was this helpful? What other topics would you like to hear about? And remember, you can always find lots of information at drbrayton.com as well as my YouTube channel. And I'm always hanging out on Instagram as well.